Good morning and welcome everybody to Digital Leaders. My name is Rose Marley and I am the CEO of Cooperatives UK. And today I'd like to talk about why I believe there's going to be a roaring 20s and why cooperative tech is best place to lead what we know as Industry 4.0. So in terms of what has happened with uh, the, the pandemic and in terms of looking at what that pandemic did, without a doubt, the pandemic has in exposed inequalities across the UK and actually throughout the world and created an empathy with mutality and cooperation. The pandemic really has accelerated tech, including not least the ability for people to work from home. But prior to the pandemic, there was already a lot of things in play with regards to what I'd say we call industry 4.0. And in actual fact, Industry 4.0 is um, a reflection of the next, the reason it's called Industry 4.0 is it's a reflection of the next version of an industrial revolution across um, the UK and indeed the world. Um, and in terms of the way that that will pan out, you know, as we rebuild and recalibrate new ways of working and new technologies, are set to collaborate and merge, forging the anatomy of our future business and opportunity for all. Now, cooperative values we'll go on to talk about are really well placed to play an essential role in creating this brave new world. The cooperative movement has been disrupting and challenging traditional business models for over 175 years. And now is the time for the principles of the past to become the guiding lights for the future. Cooperation can and will present the solutions and the infrastructure to enable optimism for our future and a trustworthy and reliable roadmap to enable us all to build back better. So when we talk about revolution, then what, what do we actually mean? And I'm going to talk about a, a quote from the philosopher Bertrand Russell from the 1950s. And in the 1950s, the kind of world that, you know, wor world of work that would have been um, the experience of many people would have looked a lot like uh, the factories, people coming together in one place. But also... The way that we work now, as you can see, when you look at something like a data farm, even though there's that level of activity all happening in one place, the people aren't necessarily together in that one place. And what indeed is happening is that we'll completely transform the way we live, consume and work across the 2020s. And I truly believe that this decade will be pivotal for mankind and we will see a true revelation a full return to um what i believe is cottage industry before the very first industrial revolution um but on a global village scale so in terms of the you know what are the things that are happening that are going to enable this technological revolution well We've got the rollout of 5G networks across the world. And then we, on top of that, we also have hardware advancements. And those hardware advancements might be seen in things, for example, like 3D printers, robotics, nanotechnology, and actually increased open source, which means that combined with 5G rollout, people will be able to improve their everything everywhere at any time now we talk about uh, human collaboration with artificial, artificial intelligence uh, in terms of ai aas ai the artificial intelligence as a service and actually artificial intelligence is expected to be at human level of performance by 2030. So that means our artificial intelligence is enabled 
um, by 2030 to operate at the same level as you are, I might operate now. Um, and actually, that can present itself as quite a scary proposition. But when you start to look at AI as a service, which we will go on to talk about, and start to look at it as a symbiotic relationship in the development of mankind, it actually becomes a real enabler. Uh, we're also seeing instant fulfillment, uh, not least uh, with the development of, of drones. And again, with the pandemic, you know, the uh, Amazon orders, the, the local orders from Deliveroo, that instant fulfillment was really accelerated by the pandemic again. But it's just not a novelty what's going to come. Uh, you know, th the, the spatial web or web 3.0, as it is known, which will be enabled in this next decade, will we'll see us looking at our future in the way we've seen in, in films like Minority Report, for example, uh, where we've got potentially we're interacting with, with holograms. And I guess the point is really that what the spatial web is right now, we go to our computers and turn on a screen, we go to our phones and interact with our screen but the spatial web means that everything will be all around us and everything will be connected and again you'll start to see that in things like um the you know alexa use of uh, voice prompts and non-verbal signals really will become the norm you know everything will be connected across the planet if you think about the internet of things where you know your fridge is telling you shopping order that you're out of orange juice you know all the traffic lights are feeding information to your car um, about all sorts of uh, subject matters, I'm sure. So I'm going to ask you to start thinking about that connection because it's that connection that's been enabled by, let's say, Web 3.0 added to the Industrial Revolution and all these technological advancements that I believe will really demonstrate what we need to start thinking about now in terms of uh, cooperation and technology. So if you think about the human uh, body then, and look, let's look at the tech that we know to be true because lots more tech's coming that we don't know about yet, but let's look at the tech that we know about now. And let's consider that artificial intelligence acts like our brain, like I say, by 2030, artificial intelligence will be at the level where it can think like a human being. Uh, and then if we look at what might enhance our eyesight, we've got virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. So whether that's putting on a set of goggles like you saw from our uh, cooperative many members Animorph in an earlier slide, or whether that's implants, whether that's glasses, whether that's the actual um, screen that you're using that's augmenting that reality, we're going to have an enhanced vision. What we see will be enhanced possibly with data and lots more information, different views, different opportunities to look at things in different ways. Again, let's look at blockchain. You know, blockchain is an infinite memory you know which is fairly unhackable but the idea of having this continuous capability to build on knowledge and build on memory through blockchain and it is of course what uh, some of the um uh, technologies uh, around cryptocurrency like bitcoin are also uh, built on and then again thinking about automation we briefly mentioned um, the, the sort of instant fulfillment, you know, what's going on in warehouses, that level of automation. And then in think of your fingertips in terms of robotics. Now, if you start to think about all of this in the way that the world being connected, in the way that human body is connected, if you just think about, for example, what might happen if you bang your leg. If you bang your leg, you get pain, you get signals sent to tell you the pain is a problem. All the blush rush, rush, blood rushes towards the site of where that bang has happened in case there's a break in the skin and all the different uh, cells need to attack the bacteria and we need to uh, the fibrogen to be able to cover um the, the scars you know so all these signals start happening and actually if you did break the skin and all of that you know blood rushed into into the, the site of the cut and um, but there wasn't actually indeed an infection well at a later date your body would start telling you that you'd get a rise in temperature your body telling you that there's this problem somewhere else in your body that isn't your head 
if you start to think about the possibilities that Industry 4.0 and the enablement of the spatial web and start to think about things being that connected, we've got this amazing capability combined with big data to know that there's a problem brewing in a certain territory and what that might look like. Obviously, this can all be significantly compounded by all sorts of things like fake news. Um, but you do start to see how the world becomes connected and how, in actual fact, tech could then start monitoring the world's problems and solving them before they even present as a problem. It's a really exciting time. Like I say, it's going to be a pivotal period for mankind. The acceleration of, of tech is going to happen really, really quickly but it is going to happen. So, you know, coming back to this point about needing to, to code for cooperation, I'm just going to touch on the um, artificial intelligence uh, comment that we've made in terms of AI as a service. Because I say, you know, we do get presented with, you know, Terminator, the robots are going to take over the, the world. But in actual fact, if you start thinking about the potential of what, human collaboration with artificial intelligence will do. You'll start to see industries like, for example, the insurance industry won't be any longer about having to pay out and fix things. It'll be a prevention industry. If you think about it in the context, all that tech supplying an insurance company, um, warning signs, machine learning, actually when this starts to happen, this tends to happen, right? Well, what we need to do is make sure that we've enabled the organization to be robust in, in the event of uh, the need for that level of resilience. Again, you can probably imagine all the things that can go horribly wrong with what I've just described there with insurance, not least, you know, hospital bills costing lots of money because your AI is predicting that you might have a problem in a future. So this is really, really important. This is why we need to be in the mix um, when we're actually programming technology. And I'm just going to spend a little more time on that. There's a brilliant book called um, How to Talk to uh, Robots that I recommend uh, to you all. But this is uh, taken from that book, and it was about when the original um, idea of actually getting um, aeroplanes to be flown by artificial intelligence, which is now a thing. The military do use AI to, to fly. When those tests first started taking place, what actually happened was that the programming of the artificial intelligence was to make sure that there was a perfect landing as denoted by this whole set of series. What does a perfect landing look like? And the AI, you need to get 10 out of 10 to have landed that plane perfectly. And quite quickly and early on, what actually happened is that the plane started slamming into the ground um, and that happened second, third time. And they realized indeed what was actually happening was that the AI had worked out that if the plane was slammed into the ground, it would break the system and it reset the system to a perfect 10. And that, to me, really shows you my point about how you've got to be in the mix at a programming level. Because the question really should have been, or the program should have really been, make sure the passengers are safe. So by asking the wrong question or programming the wrong algorithm, you can see what may go wrong and how and why. And like I said, these are real high level kind of, of, of views uh, to enable, like I say, AI at human level performance. We're going to get some of this wrong as mankind, but I'm here today to say that actually working with uh, cooperative movement and the principles and values around cooperation, you know, these values have been around for a long time and they have stood the test of time. I'm just going to talk about some of them now because these values, these 10 values that all cooperatives are based on and in actual fact for 175 years now um, have provided um, a beacon for businesses and it's always like you know Shakespeare's a good example in English literature you know every episode of EastEnders and Coronation Street now there'll be themes still that were you know in, in Shakespeare's uh, plays and it's a similar thing you know we could 
reassess these values and rewrite them in in different, more popular world, words. But the truth is, you know, the things like equality, honesty, openness, these values have stood the test of time for 175 years. And at a period of significant change that we're about to go through, I believe we could hold on to these values and make sure we bring in these values into our um, uh, industry and development of our industry, then that we really have got something solid that we can potentially rely on to give mankind the capability to do what the animal kingdom has been doing for years, cooperate, work together for a better and more successful outcome. So in terms of the actual uh, principles of cooperation that define how a, a cooperative operates, um, the principles here, for example, that a co-op is owned and controlled by its members and a co-op is democratic. Now, this is a real growing awareness that, again, I believe has been heightened by the pandemic. But if you just even think about what happened with the European Super League, people are starting to realise that if they have a stake in where they work, where they live, where they um, enjoy their, their lives together. If they have a stake, then they've got a say, they've got the capability to do something about it. So the idea of the democratic economy really is a growing phenomena throughout the world. So when you start to look at the principles that define how a cooperative operates and then start to look at that in terms of tech because we've just talked about tech in terms of the values as an enabler you know tech is going to enable the world to possibly be better uh, at looking after mankind and developing mankind but when you start to look at tech not just as an enabler but actually as a sector is a real growth in what we call the platform cooperatives now, a platform cooperative is, is predominantly uh, app-based and they tend to be multi-stakeholder co-ops where members of the uh, co-op uh, are both the users and the suppliers. Um, so an example, you know, uh, Up and Go, which you can see um, on, on the screen there, is a Manhattan-based cleaning uh, organisation. And there's a brilliant film by the cooperative um, around the world, the media cooperative, that shows Up and Go. It talks to the staff. And these are cleaners based in New York that previously, you know, had all the things that we know can be a problem with app-based booking systems, which included that they were sent to jobs that they didn't have enough time to achieve. But really interestingly, when you watch that film, they also talk about the outcomes of being able to control the environment that they are working in. Um, things like sexual harassment in the workplace massively uh, reduced for the up and go um, cooperative. Um, right by me, I live in uh, Manchester in uh, England, and uh, this is the Charlton bike delivery. And this came very much out of the pandemic. This was the idea idea that people needed things delivering this whole cyclists that were uh, basically um, offering to help and enable that and they've turned that into a business um, again where they get to choose their hours they get to choose their, their rights and what's really been growing um, in the pandemic is the open food network which is a way for locally produced food to be distributed in a really effective way so again the buyers and the suppliers are on there. Um, I'm very excited about the potential for uh, equal care um, co-op because the idea with uh, care to have the actual carers as well as the people that are booking the care. So that might be you booking care for yourself or for a family member, or it might be a local authority booking that care. For them to all have one member, one vote in that scenario means that, of course, the workers at Equal Care Co-op are getting way more than the real living wage. They're getting much better hours. They're getting to choose the clients. But like I say, the clients themselves are getting a lot of say in that process and development. So platform cooperatives are really, you know, a, a type of cooperative to watch for generally. Um, and then when it comes to that, you know, what's been happening, the reason this is important is because, you know, tech is currently driven 
uh, you know, by, by profit in actual fact. Um, so you've got two things. One, tech is clunky. Always at the beginning of, of new tech, it's clunky. I'm sure like me, you think that actually technology is ruining your life instead of enhancing it at the moment, at the amount of, you know, whether it's social media, you've got to keep on top on our things that you've got to be aware of or ethical policies that you need to know. You know, tech uh, is really clunky at this stage. And because it's profit driven. So if you take the example, you know, of maybe, you know, uh, you know, something like a, an app that's uh, for taxi drivers would be a good example. You know, the amount of, of, of money that needs to be paid back to the investors because it's been profit driven means that it's where the drivers are being squeezed. And again, you know, when tech is driven by profits, that also means that things like the workers' rights and other social considerations are at the top of the agenda for that business. Getting that tech fully used and deployed is at the top of the um, agenda. Um, so when you start to apply, let's like say, the cooperative principles to something like cooperative platforms and tech, well, suddenly the decisions and the wealth are shared by the many as opposed to the few that are sharing the decisions in making tech now and not only just the decisions and wealth are shared by the many they're shared by the people who are directly impacted by those decisions which is a huge consideration i mean it's something at carps uk we're really really excited about the development of, of cooperative platforms and we have something called the unfounder accelerator um and we're in the middle of a cohort at the moment developing uh for example, people to be able to develop their ideas into tech, and we'll be running that again. Um, we've got two accelerator programs running this year, supported by the Cooperative Bank, um, but we, we will be opening new rounds soon. It's minimum teams of six with mentoring and support for 10 weeks. So I just say that if this is something you want to get into, you don't need to be a techer. You know, if you, you've already got a co-op or you're thinking of starting a co-op um, and you want to come on the, uh, or apply for the Unfound Accelerator, you can do that through the Co-ops UK website uh, and this, uh, applications will be open for the autumn edition on the 1st of July but like I say you don't need to be a techie you just need to know what your cooperative idea is how you will instill those values and principles in that business and then like I say working with the Unbound team you can then work through what that might look like as an app uh, development so you don't need to be a techie you don't have to have any understanding whatsoever of uh, digital to start thinking about how you might apply digital to a cooperative. So a bit of a plug there, but like, as I'm sure you're beginning to pick up, I really care about um, cooperatives being in this space and driving digital, driving the way that we do things in this pivotal decade for mankind. So I mentioned Bertrand Russell before, and in 1954, uh, the great philosopher uh, in human society and ethics and politics said Famously, the only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperation. And I think as we kind of uh, look forward, we can start to say, you know, 100 years from now, you know, this is really becoming something that we need to consider. We do need to cooperate. We do need to collaborate. We do need to consider all the rich contexts of the world that we live in, the different people, the different geographies, the different cultures. And we will only be effective together if we do cooperate. It's really beginning to prove his philosophical thinking as being something that could actually become really true, the redemption of mankind down to cooperation. But if you start thinking about our young people, because they are our future in, in, in that respect, and, you know, the next generation, you know, we've heard, you know, about the, the, the sort of digital natives, and we look at, you know, uh, Gen Z um, often as being uh, the, the, the generation that, you know, uh, are inheriting, like I say, you know, possibly quite a dystopian future, the way it's currently being uh, sort of described. But in actual fact, the truth is that the, the, the next generation, particularly uh, Gen Z, 
do already have a huge affinity with the cooperative values in particular. Um, so there is real uh, hope there, but we've got to make sure that our laws and our policies and what we do with tech enables them to be able to, to run with this because ultimately these will be the young people that are delivering on our uh, futures. Um, but yeah, the pandemic really did, you know, again, demonstrate um, all of these inequalities and, you know, uh, the young people themselves, you know, have had a real challenging time. So it's really important that we actually start to bring them into a greater awareness of what can be achieved with the cooperative business model if you add tech to it, uh, because there's a real affinity there already. So that's something you'll start to see us pushing on from uh, Co-ops UK uh, point of view. There's a lot going on with young people across the world, the Argentine Federation of Technology and uh, Innovation, for example, which is a knowledge worker cooperative are doing some really exciting stuff. And if you look at the ICA, um, the, the youth research in the role played in unemployment. Um, so there's a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot that's speaking to our young people. And I do think it's really important to make sure that we enhance and amplify that and make the, the potentials of tech really accessible to that generation. But why then, you know, why, why do I believe that co-ops are well placed to, to lead on digital? Um, because actually, ultimately, for all those principles and values of which, is, as you've seen, there's lots of bullet points, what all cooperatives do is that they distribute power so they distribute power via this one member, one voice. So it doesn't matter if you put way more money into an organisation than the person next year. It's one member, one vote. Now, once you start distributing that power and letting everybody have a say, you get a different process and you get a different outcome and you get different results. So the distribution of power is really critical to why I believe that cooperatives are well placed to lead on digital thinking into the future of uh, tech. And then the distribution of wealth, actually the distribution of wealth is distribution of wealth because again, you know, you have the dividends, any surpluses that are made in co-ops go back to the members. Those members might be tenants of a housing association. Those members might be all the businesses that have, uh, all the cooperative businesses that have come together. However you look at that, the distribution of wealth actually results in what, again, a growing awareness of what is called community community wealth, that idea of retaining wealth within that community. So whether that's in your locality, you know, or whether that's your community of, of say, for example, a worker co-op that might be working remotely across uh, data, but the idea that you're anchoring that wealth in community again, really plays well to, you know, why the principles and values of cooperation lend themselves well to delivering on digital. So for uh, the great uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, I, I put a challenge out there. I think he's got a word wrong. Uh, I believe the only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperative tech. Uh, so that's, you know, taking the idea, I like say that tech is an enabler and cooperatives really would benefit. It would benefit the world to make sure that the data sets, the programming, the way we look at things like AI and machine learning, do have those principles and values built into them. And then secondly, tech as a sector. So, you know, tech that is driven by different considerations other than profit, again, I believe would really be pivotal for the development of mankind in a good way. Um, so I am going to be uh, taking some questions. Apologies, I forgot to say that early on. So I don't know if any of you have been putting questions in the chat. And I know that the Co-ops UK team have been collating questions that have been coming in uh, previously. Um, so I'm going to take those, stop sharing my screen and take those questions now. And if you do want to pick up this debate further, that's how uh, you can find me on various social media channels. So while you're thinking about whether or not you've got any uh, questions at this stage, uh, would you uh, let me know, Irina, if you've already got some questions? Yes. So, um, so one about the youth sector. So the term cooperative um, amongst especially the, the kind of digital aware youth is generally associated with digital games. <laughs> so how are we going to bridge between 
the cooperative term as used in in gaming and um, the real cooperative message of the movement with our youth who was not really associated with the more um, established cooperative movement? That's a, an excellent question and it's fundamental actually because the way different generations communicate is um, a challenge and the, and the understanding of different generations and it's something that I strongly believe as a movement the cooperative sector does need to look at So, like you say we talk about cooperative platforms but actually uh, describing that as collaborative tech might be more in keeping with the language of our uh, youth and it's a growing problem not just in gaming and, and digital it's across the whole kind of rise of conscious capitalism, if you like, uh, where it's really difficult for the individuals, or the average individual on the street to distinguish between, you know, what is sometimes just a marketing message around sustainability or ethics or, you know, putting it back uh, compared to actually a deep constitutionally rooted way of doing business that ensures that you're distributing power and wealth. So in answer to that question, Irina, there's a whole host of things that we do need to do as a, as a movement. So we don't educate our young people um, about cooperatives and cooperative business. You know, most people know the co-op as, as the shop at the end of your street and don't really necessarily understand that that little card that you get not only gives you money back, but it's not a marketing tool. It's actually, you know, part of uh, your, your membership right to get that money back for that financial um, contribution that you're making but also that you can vote at the AGM. You know, I sat in, uh, at the AGM for the co-op group this year and some of the discussions, you know, were really interesting around things like, you know, modern slavery and the customers were getting to have a say uh, and have a view through that process. So we really need to create an, an awareness with our young people um, about cooperative business models. Um, and that starts in the skill space. So when you do, you know, business studies, for example, at school, the cooperative business model isn't really talked about. Um, this is a whole education piece there to do. And in addition, you know, so the best way to learn is by action. So if you look at things like credit unions, which obviously mutual and uh, cooperative uh, in their very uh, design, and that working together, you know, for a, a greater good. Um, you know, I'd like to see that we actually start making things like credit unions visible to young people as they're starting to look to save, um, you know, for their own futures. And again, it's really challenging because they get approached by all sorts of um different organisations, particularly when they're young and starting out in the careers and payday loans and all that type of stuff. So, you know, we, we're kind of battling against a lot of, uh, you know, sort of marketing budgets and funds to do that. But I believe yeah. if we start to raise awareness of credit unions, that we'll do that. Um, and again, it's really important, Irina, that we're not... Um, predictive and you should do this and you should do that you know with young people actually like you say gaming gaming I, you know I've got a 16 year old that um it's fascinating because as, as the older generation if my 16 year old was you know in a forest with all his friends doing the kinds of things doing gaming like trying to work out how to get up that tree and then how to get across that one you know as my generation oh isn't it lovely that they're all working together and actually what my generation does is goes they're in the room all the time gaming well I <laughs> Actually, we need to recognise that they are developing skills and it might not be our experience of how they learn to collaborate, but gaming, you know, in, in that kind of format is actually demonstrating how collaboration achieves goals. So again, being in the right place with the right message isn't about you should do this and you should do that. It's about going, would well, you know you're already using cooperation to deliver that? And have you considered that that might be something that you want for your sports club or you want for the way that you work on? or the way that you uh, uh, intend to be able to live your lives, like I say, in this particularly pivotal period for mankind. So a lot to do with young people. Yeah. Um, and um, any more questions, Irina? We've got one more question. So data is a big issue for a lot of people who are losing all trust in tech today, um, and especially when it comes to the big tech giants. <clears throat> do you think cooperative ownership will enable more trust in tech and why? 
Yeah, I absolutely think cooperative uh, ownership will enable more trust because, like I say, the members of that cooperative, you know, it's their job to govern the cooperative and deliver that. Um, but I'm not as naive to think that all of those organisations are ever going to become cooperative. So we've still got this big piece around, like you say, data gathering, big tech. I talked, touched on it before with insurance. You know, we're getting into biotechnology now where, like I say, you know, it's not just about the data being collected that you're providing. You know, it's about, I, I did get asked that in my last insurance quote I got asked would I be prepared to wear uh, a wristband so they could monitor my activity I was actually asked that and I really was very uncomfortable uh, about it um, so actually this is my point about it's not just the cooperative businesses and business models it's about cooperative experts you know in things like AI and data you know open data uh, cooperative are a good example being on the panels, being on the government's AI panel, actually feeding into, you know, organisations that are delivering this already. And like I say, cooperatives really standing, you know, up for what they believe in. It was fascinating to see with the with the ESL, you know, when the footballers got behind, everyone was so angry about the exploitation of, of wealth. Um, but now, of course, those angry people were very famous footballers and pundits who could galvanise that uh, support of the general public we need to find more ways to do that we need to challenge what's happening with our data and our tech uh, on a regular basis so it's not just about the models it's about as a movement us being the ones that stand there and say is that operating ethically is that how you want to to see that roll out so um, i'm under no illusion that it's uh you know this is a david and goliath situation uh, but i'm delighted so many of you have joined today to join that that charge because i really believe that you know like i said you know the potential to redeem mankind will sit in cooperative tech both as an enabler and as a platform so thank you very much for joining uh, me today. It's been uh, really uh, great to see so, so many of you here. And I do uh, hope that I've given you plenty to think about. And like I say, if you're looking for any further information, go to uk.coop. And if you think that you might be suitable for our Unfound Accelerator programme, the applications will be open on the 1st of July. So thank you so much for joining me. And yeah, have a think about what we might do with our cooperative futures in digital. Thank you. Mm -hmm.